Hello and welcome to or welcome back to Lauren's Legends. The story that I have today is something straight out of a horror film and it takes place in Massachusetts. It is something that the next time that you hear your house creak, it will definitely make you look over your shoulder. So sit back, relax and enjoy. Annie and her sister Jessica were trying to distract themselves. They were young teenage girls in 1986 and their mother had just recently passed from cancer. The landline begins to ring and the 15 year old girl goes and answers it. On the other end of the phone, a young man introduces himself. He says, hello, I'm Danny LaPlante and a friend of yours gave me your phone number. At this time, Annie was very lost and alone and she continues to speak with Danny over the phone for several days. Danny proceeds to tell her over their numerous conversations that he is 16 years old, he goes to a fellow high school and he is captain of the football team. Interested, Annie agrees to go on a date with him. Her excited younger sister Jessica helps her pick out her outfit. For a very short split second, the girls are not thinking about their mother. They aren't thinking about how their dad is gone all day, trying to provide for them even twice as hard now that their mother is gone. They're just two excited young girls in the moment. Danny pulls up in the driveway and Annie runs out and gets in the car. She was unfortunately immediately disappointed. He was dirty and he smelled bad. Not wanting to be rude, she still goes out on a date with him and they go and get ice cream. The whole time in the back of her head, she knew that she was never going to go out with him again. When she got home, she was let down and even more depressed. And so was Jessica. The young girl had been excited to hear the details about going out with a boy. At this time, Annie deeply missed her mother and her advice. Then they thought about it. Tucked away deep down in their basement was a Ouija board. Thinking that this may be the only way that they could contact their mother, they pulled it out and began asking it questions. But nothing seemed to be happening, so they decided to go ahead and put it back away. Their dad would probably still not be home for hours, so the sad girls just decided to go to bed. Annie had just laid down in her bed, getting comfortable. She had just started to close her eyes, and then she heard it, the tapping. She sat straight up in her bed, listening so intently. Jessica then rushed in the room, hopping on her bed excited. The girls believed that this was their mother communicating with them. Thrilled, they begin asking her questions and they begin getting intelligent responses to their questions. But after this night and as the days progressed, the girls started noticing that objects in the house would be moved around in weird locations. The tapping was now beginning to scare them. They had started believing that they had summoned something evil. They decided to go to their dad and tell them what they had done and what was happening. Their dad, Brian Andrews, believed that this was a way that they had begun to deal with their trauma. After all, the noises never happened when he was home. The tapping had begun to intensify and the girls were not only terrified, but they were becoming increasingly frustrated. Their dad, Brian, tried to calm them down. He told them, it's an old house. It makes weird noises. Maybe it's a squirrel or animal or something that's gotten down in the basement. And then one evening, the girls heard it. It was loud and it was coming from the basement. They decided to go and investigate. They were walking down the basement stairs and then suddenly it stops. Seeing and noticing that the basement wall looked weird, they moved closer. There was red writing on the wall that said, come find me, I'm hiding in your closet. The girls immediately panicked upon reading this, ran out of the basement and fled the house over to their neighbor's house. They called their dad and immediately he came home. Brian first goes to the neighbor's house checking on his daughters and then decides to go in and check his own house. When he walks in the front door, the house is in a complete disarray. His heart then begins thumping because he knew that his girls would never do this. He went quietly, moving from room to room, and then he made it to Annie's room. When he looked inside, 
there was a man standing in the middle of the room. This man had a wig on and was wearing one of Brian's late wife's dresses. The scariest thing of all though is in his hand was an ax. He immediately booked it out of the house to call 911. When the police arrived, at first, it appeared that the man had escaped. The police did decide to do a very thorough look through the entire house. Upon looking, one of the police officers was looking under the basement stairs at the crawl space, and he found a hidden access where you could go between the walls of the house. Going down this area, he could see that there were holes in every single room where someone could look in there. Following food debris, he found Danny LaPlante hiding way back as far as you could go in this area. He had been living in the Andrews walls for over two months. Horrified, Brian realized that every single time his girls had told him about the noises they had been hearing, the lights turning on and off, it had been this creep the entire time. Danny was arrested, but he was only 16 at the time and they sent him to a juvenile detention facility and he was only there for a year. Danny was a very disturbed person and many people wanted him to stay in there longer, but because of his age, there was nothing that they could do to get him a longer sentence. As soon as Danny was released, reports began happening all over the area again of break-ins. On November 16th, 1987, the Gustafsson family had come home to find their house had been broken into. They obviously immediately called the police and made a report. This deeply scared Priscilla and her husband Andrew because they had two small children that lived in the home with them. They added more locks and added more safety measures. On December 1st, Andrew had been out of the home and when he came home, he found his entire family, his pregnant wife, and his two young children passed away. Due to how close this home was to Danny's home, the police brought him in for questioning and they searched his house and found evidence that he was guilty of what happened to this family. Finally, on October 25th, 1988, he was found guilty of three murders and got three life sentences for what he had done. This story is very disturbing and it makes me wonder what would have happened if they would have given him a longer sentence in the beginning. Would it have changed any of the outcome of what he would later do? Maybe Danny had planned to do that the entire time to the Andrews family, but Brian, the father, unknowingly stopped it when he found him in that room. Please let me know what you think about this entire situation in the comment section down below. Thank you so much for watching. Please do not forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. See you next time.